Don't worry, I didn't forget about this Q&A video. Uh, but before we start, I have to say thank you all for 5,000 subscribers, and thank you to the 700 new subscribers that came as a result of my uh, newest video essay upload, which was very successful, and I'm very happy about that. And the success of that video is part of the reason why I didn't upload this Q&A video earlier, just because I had the rare opportunity to just sit back and enjoy, like, growth and success from an upload, and that's something I don't get really often with this channel. So, I was just really happy about that, and sorry if some people were, I guess, waiting for this video a little longer than they should have. And, uh, regarding Q&A videos as well, typically they're usually, like, the least popular on my channel, so instead of doing, like, the face cam or whatever, I'll try and do some more, like, advanced editing for these to make them more entertaining, and hopefully more people will watch them because of the kind of editing that I plan to do when I finish this recording. And one more little thing, uh, because I have so many questions to go through, I'll try and answer them as fast as possible. So don't expect them to be like a full representation of what I think. If you want like a clarification, any of you just ask in the comments and I'll see if I can reply. So yeah, now for real, let's get into it. <laughs> Amer Freestyle says, or asks, why did you become a leftist? Um, most of it is due to my connection to Yugoslavia as my entire family being from there and I guess something passed down almost almost like genetically which led me to first becoming a Titoist who didn't read any theory and then as I grew older and then I eventually came across to be a Marxist Leninist and then soon enough Marxist Leninist with other Marxist Leninist characteristics and more theories that came after Marxist Leninism from the 20th century and things like that. My good friend Jokando Yokando says, ah, epic. Question, is it really possible to unite the former Yugoslav countries, or is it just idealism? Um, given a certain series of events, it is possible. I could easily say anything is possible, but just to be more realistic, given the crises that are expected to come in the near future within capitalism during the 21st century, I feel that there is a chance for some kind of movement to emerge to reunite the Yugoslav countries as people there we speak the same language essentially besides like Slovenian which is a little which is you know a little different same with Macedonian which is also a little different but more or less we speak essentially the same language and there is a still a strong connection there between the people it's mostly just borders that are being forced by NATO and imperial attempts to create banana republics that's that are split up and unable to stand up to a larger influence being you know USA Britain NATO countries, that kind of thing. If, if that can be um, overcome, then I think it's pretty possible for that unity to happen again uh, before the end of the 21st century. Vitron asks, my question, will you ever have live streams with other leftists, and if so, can we slash they make a communist village in Minecraft? So for the first part of that question, I don't really consider live streams happening in the future, at least on a regular basis. I recorded some, like, pre-recorded, non-scripted videos, like with, a uh, Bolinkaj, and one time with Batko, but outside of that, like, genuine live streams, I would say it's possible, but I'm kind of against the idea of live streaming on this channel because I don't have the ability to, you know, edit and plan and do all of this, like, work to create a finished product in the form of, of a video. When it comes to live streaming, you know, there are certain things that I can't control, like if I say, Maybe an offensive joke by accident, or if I say, for example, express an opinion that uh, does not reflect what I actually believe, and I, you know, use the incorrect wording because I'm not in a full capability of expressing what I actually have to believe. For example, word choice, like language. There's, there's a lot of things that make live streaming unattractive to me. But I wouldn't mind doing like a casual stream with another content creator on, a, on another content creator's channel. I wouldn't mind being a guest. You know, I, I like collaborations, and if there are people who want to do collaborations, then make a comment here, I guess, if you wish. As for the Communist Village of Minecraft, I know the Finnish Bolshevik had or has a Minecraft server, I believe. So, if you can hunt uh, the link to Finbol's commune, which is the Discord server that he has, if you can find that link and get to the server, then I'm pretty sure you can find your way to the Minecraft server as well, I believe. And Nev asks, why do you have a Yugo marked American F-86 F-2 shooting down a Soviet MIG-15BIS in your intro? 
So, I got the video for my intro from a channel called Oxide, which does like War Thunder videos, and one of them had the, the Yugoslav flag and some 80s Yugoslav music from a band that I like, and there was a scene that was really cool, which is the one in my intro where like the plane flies up and shoots another plane, and the other plane is like flying down, like basically that. It looks pretty cool. Next, from Kroknik, or as I know him, Trotsnitz. One, thoughts on Hoja and Hojaism, and two, is there any advice you'd give to younger Marxists? So, for Hoja, Hoja was a very, um, I respect him as a revolutionary, very much so. But for Hojaism, his ideology, I think that in the context of the 21st century, it's not really something that is relevant anymore. The kind of anti-revisionism that Hoja was talking about was specific to the time where Hoja lived, right? Hoja no longer, you know, exists, he's dead. So it's difficult to apply Hoj the, the classic form of Hojaism to anything in the 21st century. I, I haven't seen any real like theoretical development of Hojaism after Hoja himself. Whereas with Marxism and Leninism, like there is, you know, Marxism and Leninism, Maoism, you have Paul Cockshaw making uh, cybernetic socialism theories like that, towards new socialism, books like that. And you have developments coming after Marxism and Leninism for the 21st century and having that theory being created and analyzed for modern material conditions. I don't see the same for Hojaism. Two, is there any advice you give to younger Marxists? Okay, so I I assume younger means primary school and secondary school. So for that, I would say um, younger people who are generally having more time use your time when you can to share like memes, videos regarding theory or um, current events or geopolitics, like you know things like that. And also, uh, re also you yourself uh, read theory. Theory is important. Reading Marxist theory to understand what Marxism is about is certainly very, very important. Uh, for younger people, you may not really understand everything that you read, but try with the, the basic stuff and build up as you gain that understanding of more complicated subjects as you grow older, essentially. Talk to people, of course, arguments, things like that, debate, that kind of stuff. Those three, four things are pretty important to do if you have time and if you are of a younger age. So, Reger Busi says, What's your thoughts on communization theory? Two, where do you fall in the political sextant? And three, recommended books. Um, I have heard of communization theory. I think it's like a combination of like left comms and libertarian socialists and anarcho-communists or anarchists. I, I just know what it is ba in, in, in basic terms. I don't know much about it, nor do I have a real defined opinion, because I don't really know enough about it to have an opinion. But that's all I really have to say for number one. Two, where do you fall in the political sextant? Uh, using the power of uh, editing magic, I will show you right now. And three, recommended books. So I think most people who watch this channel are familiar with the classic works like Das Kapital, of course, Communist Manifesto, Principles of Communism by Engels, you know, um, Imperialism, High Stage of Capitalism, State and Revolution, books like that. So I'm going to recommend some books that are newer and more reflective of the modern era, and those books are... Uh, Towards New Socialism by Paul Conkshot. It discusses socialism in the context of cybernetics and cybernetic planning and using computers and technology to do central planning as opposed to what was in the past with the Soviet Union and systems like that. Another recommended book for this time and era is uh, Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher. It discusses well the concept of capitalist realism and I think it's a very important work for anybody who wants to analyze the uh, postmodern condition, or understand the postmodern condition from a Marxist context more. And the last book that I would say, a book by Marxist economist Michael Roberts called The Long Depression. It's basically all about the falling rate of profit, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, that concept, and it discusses modern implications, like with the recession, the, the Great Recession recently, and modern economic factors and data and analysis within, as I mentioned, the modern context. So, yeah, those are my three recommended books, among many others, but those are the three that I'll say right now if you want to have some more modern things to read regarding more modern subjects in the context of Marxism. And Kolo Komuna asks, Thoughts on Luxembourgism slash Council Communism. So, I don't really put Luxembourgism and Council Communism as like a slash together. However, 
I'll just split them up for the sake of this. So Luxembourgism, Lux Rosa Luxembourg was a very important Marxist, and all all Marxists should at one point or another read about Rosa Luxembourg and what she had to say about theory and the revolution in Germany, uh, the Spartacus League. That's very important from a historical context. And also from a theoretical context, Rosa Luxemburg influenced the left communists that would come after Rosa Luxemburg, the Italian left communists and other left communists. She would influence uh, council communists, she would influence Lenin and uh, Leninists, and various other groups. The theories of Luxemburg, while they're not really much on their own, they did have a very profound impact on the Marxist movement as a whole and other ideologies within Marxism, which is very significant and people should read into that and read more about that. As for council communism, I feel that, or I find personally, that Leninism solves the problems that I have with council communism, almost like an advancement and a superior improvement to council communism with people like Panakoic. That's how I feel. Council communism is interesting, but I just think that Leninism improves on the issues that I have with council communism as an individual ideology. And Nixborn asks, do you think that automation is environmentally sustainable? It can be environmentally sustainable if the energy you use to power the automation is renewable. You know, if, if, if we switch our energy to more renewable sources like wind, solar, uh, geothermal, and uh, nuclear. Nuclear isn't really um, fully renewable, but it's, you know, it, it's pretty good. If we can use those more efficient and more environmentally safe energy sources, then we would be able to have an automation that is good for the environment. Not, well, that is sustainable within the environment of this planet. And Joseph Stalin asks, Thoughts on Levrenti Beria, thoughts on Algerian and Sudanese revolutions this year, and three, why a lot of leftists hate Trotsky. So, with Beria, um, I know who Beria is, but I don't really have an opinion so much on him, like... He was a very important member of the Stalin-era USSR government. He was a possible successor to Stalin, and he apparently engaged in some like pedophile stuff, which is uh, uh, uh very uh, uh, yeah, uh. But I don't really have, I mean, I don't really have a defined opinion on him. Really, like he's, you know, he's 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 Beria. He was there, you know, he did things, and he had an impact on Soviet history, and that's all I really have to say. And thoughts on the Algerian and Sudanese revolutions this year. I know that they happened, but I'm not very clear with the details regarding who is doing the revolution. Are they like real socialist or are they like reformist or whatever? I just don't know much about that. So I'm happy that there is change going on um, in the sense that I hope that this change is positive in the interests of workers and socialism as a whole. But I don't know if it is, so I won't say much. I just know that something is happening there, and it's hopefully good in the interests of socialism and the workers, and etc, etc. And three, why do a lot of leftists hate Trotsky? Um, for Marxist-Leninists, it should be obvious why they don't like Trotsky. But for anarchists, um, I know like a lot of anarchists have issues with Trotsky because he was responsible for crushing the uh, Black Army, the Free Territory of Ukraine, during the Russian Civil War. So, that, so that's uh, that's where a lot of people hate Trotsky from. A lot of anarchists hate Trotsky from. As for left communists, um, I think left communists share a lot of the critique of, that they have with Trotsky, with regards to the USSR. So I think there's more of like a connection there, a positive connection there. But I'm not so sure. I also know that a lot of leftists like have a problem, not really, like, they have problems with Trotsky, but they have more so problems with Trotsky's followers. The followers of Trotsky, like, created, you know, the whole split the party meme, the whole newspaper meme, the whole, you know, pesadism, the entire ideology, like, like this stuff, and other developments and events have gotten a lot of hate towards Trotskyists and Trotskyism, and as a result, Trotsky himself. Which is unfair, because Trotsky didn't predict Pesadism, or didn't even say anything like that with Pesadism, or stuff like that, like splitting the party, or newspapers, I believe. But, you know, that that kind of hate just came as a result by association. I, I think that covers all of the bases with hatred of leftists on Trotsky, and if there's any more that I missed, please discuss them in the comments. And Maximilian Gale asks, or Maximilian Gale asks, Opinion of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and Opinion on Hearts of Iron Four. I think Poland-Lithuania, the, the Commonwealth, was certainly a very interesting entity within Eastern Europe during the Middle Ages slash Renaissance. 
it was certainly a high point in the history of Polish people and Lithuanian people, given how massive the country was in between powers like Germany or the Holy Roman Empire and Russia. That, that was certainly a very interesting anomaly that happened in Eastern European history and Polish and Lithuanian history. And I think the state overall was very um, interesting given its existence overall. As for Hearts of Iron 4, I tried the game, I tried to like the game, but I just don't like Hearts of Iron 4. I just don't like Paradox games in general. I, I tried Hearts of Iron 3, Victoria 2, um, what else? Crusader Kings 2, Europa Universalis. I just, I just don't have an enjoyment for these grand strategy games that Paradox releases. It's just not something that I like. I try, but I just don't like it. I know many people who do like these games, but I just don't, and I tried, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pete Derrick says, Would you consider making a book video? Opinion on China today, and where do you see a possible revolution, or a revolution possibly taking place? Um, you see, I don't like to summarize books because I prefer that people actually read the theory instead of relying on secondary sources. And even if I do create a book video, or a book review, I feel like I could leave out or overemphasize certain information. Which happens with all secondary sources, as all secondary sources are to some degree biased. So, those are the two major reasons why I, I don't really do or want to do book videos. But, I recommend, you know, most of these works are free online, Marxist works. Just go to Marxists.org and just look it up and read the content. And if you don't want to read the content, there are also audiobooks. There is a channel called Leftist Theory Audiobooks. I know the person who runs the channel, pretty good guy. And also, uh, Finnish Bolsheviks second channel, which is Marxist Leninist Theory. He, he that entire channel is basically dedicated to audiobooks and basically just audiobooks. And you can also find audiobooks online on YouTube and other places for works completely without cost. Like there's like someone read all of Das Kapital in many, many hours, and you, you can even get an audiobook of that as well. So, I recommend just reading the actual theory and not relying on secondary sources. Like, if you, wanna, if you want a summary of a certain work, then I would say that Wikipedia is okay. It's, it, it's fine, but there's, some, there's sometimes a lot of bias given that, you know, the English language has a lot of bias against communism and socialism and things like that. And the Tank God asks, Question 1. What is your favorite patriotic propaganda song from any socialist country? And Question 2. Are you a determinist or a believer in free will? So for Question 1, um, I have many favorite songs. It's difficult to pick one, as many people might say. But there was one that I listened to recently, which I haven't heard of before, and it's pretty popular. It is a uh, song about Mao Zedong, and it's very, like, it's very catchy. I'll, I'll, I'll play it right now. Like I said, I was surprised that I didn't hear this song before, and it's certainly, it's certainly very catchy. It's, it's very, it's very entertaining. And so, for, for now, let's just say that is my favorite song. But we also, we cannot forget, you know, the, the beautiful cover of Without the Communist Party, There Would Be No New China by uh, Brother Hao. And, question two, are you a determinist or a believer in free will? So, I take kind of a, a radical centrist position regarding this issue, and that is um, a position that Marx wrote about somewhere. I forgot the exact work, but I think I think I have a, an image saved with like the quotation on there somewhere, so I'll try and find that, and if I do find it, it'll be right here. And Mitchell Brecht asks, I absolutely love your videos, thank you very much. If you could answer at least one of these, that would be great. Thoughts on 1. The DPRK, 2. Rojava Syria, 3. Gaddafi, 4. Cuba's new constitution, 5. America's coming over the Ron, and what is the best party for an ML in the Northeast US to join? Okay, 
with the GPRK, I think it is extremely, extremely, extremely impressive how the GPRK has survived this long after losing the Soviet Union and Russia as their primary trading partner with 70 to 75 percent of imports and exports being from the USSR. The fact that they survived that is extremely impressive. The fact that they survived the the droughts in 1994, given their lack of trading partners, is extremely impressive. They survived an embargo by the United States, which is extremely impressive. They survived, they, like, DPRK and the government and the people, they, they survived, like, so much. And it's insane how the country is still man managing to exist, and exist relatively well, given everything that the country is facing right now. It, it's, it's, it's extremely impressive, and that's really my thoughts on the DPRK overall. Like, it's, it, it's impressive that the DPRK has managed to survive this long against so many forces acting against it. And the country now has nuclear weapons, which is extremely impressive still, like, it's mind-blowing how impressive it is, how they've survived. MBOZ space underscore says, questions, one, thoughts on national Bolshevism, actual ideology, not meme, and two, will you ever do another collaboration with Botko? So, national Bolshevism is an ideology that came out of Russia during the late 20th century, and it has some roots or connections with the German Nazbols during the height of the leftist movements there. So, I would say that Nazbol is certainly a very interesting ideology. It's, 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 it's Bolshevism mixed with Russian nationalism, and it doesn't really have a, a, a proper existence outside of Russia. Um, if for whatever reason a communist movement is not possible in Russia, then I would take a Nazbol revolution in Russia as the next best thing. I guess you can say those are my thoughts. Outside of Russia, Nazbol is mostly a meme or not defined by anything like there's no there's no Nazbol doctrine that is international in the same way that Marxism has an international, you know, presence. And two, will you ever do another collaboration with Botko? Well, because this question was made uh, before Botko stopped his channel, Botko did stop his channel, and I guess that essentially means that no collaboration is possible, unless he comes back, which I hope will happen eventually. Hopefully Botko will come back, and if he does, well, good. And Mikhail Vorobev asks, Do you think it's time to organize another international? Um... No. The international left as a whole basically doesn't exist. I think a lot of the left died with the end of the Soviet Union, and then the social democratic platforms that were created by uh, capitalist nations also weaken leftist movements inside of Western capitalist countries domestically, and now we're in a very tough position. Honestly, another, the next major world crisis in the form of the next major economic depression, which will happen sometime in the next 10 years, I think that is a stepping point for creating the opportunity to make a movement that can lead up to another international. Because right now, there's no chance of that happening. There's really just, there's nothing significant in the Western world right now that indicates that it's time for an international. And a lot of work needs to be done to even consider international. So, overall, it's not time. There is much more work to do, and that's going to have to happen at some point later on with, with something to do with the next major capitalist crisis. Do you want to organize people around you to read some 10 essential Marxist works? Um... Spreading ideology to the community around you is certainly very important, but me personally, I'm not really in a position to do that right now. However, I would say that if people if people watching this are able to do such a thing, then do it. RMD Jacobi says, What do you think of the Indonesian Communist Party and the 1965 anti-communist massacres? So, I don't know much about the particular ideology of the, of the Indonesian Party, but Regarding the massacres, it's a shame what happened, really, because the party was very powerful, and the massacres were an extremely significant event in, in Indonesian history, and I'm surprised that the West, you know, well, I'm not, not really surprised, but I mean, you, you would expect education systems in the West to not talk about the massacres, especially because they were done under a pro-United States government. But it is, the Indonesian Communist Party was certainly very powerful in Indonesia when it was at its high point, and the massacres were just very unfortunate to happen. 2. What are your thoughts on the recent Hong Kong protests? Uh, good question. So, honestly, I think that the Hong Kong protests... Okay. The Hong Kong protests started when I think a man murdered his wife or other close relative, 
and then he was at some point in Hong Kong and then the Chinese wanted to extradite him to China to face trial for the murder but then Hong Kong rejected that because they saw that it would be used to extradite more people uh, for other reasons so that kind of caused the protest to happen among other things and other reasons okay for that first step um, the thing is the Chinese government already is able to find most of the people they're looking for anyway of course it takes more effort to do like certain methods of finding people and whatever but the Chinese government like regardless of there being an extradition bill or regardless of there being the extradition policy or not still manages to get a hold of the people it's looking for so I just like in that sense the extradition bill wouldn't really change much in the sense that China is already extraditing people to from China, from Hong Kong to China just using more crafty methods now this would make it easier obviously to have that happen it would make that process of extraditing criminals easier and you know wouldn't it wouldn't require so many steps for the Chinese government to do all this you know these crafty methods just to get somebody into their country for judgment or whatever now as for the the protests themselves especially recently there's been like a lot of stuff coming out of Western media about oh liberate Hong Kong Hong Kong is not free or whatever but honestly Tobari Shandimian, he did a video talking about the free market paradise that is Hong Kong. And he also talked about Singapore as well, but Hong Kong has some of the freest markets in the world. And that was a subject that he was talking about in the video, you know, free markets relating to working conditions and environments. In that video, there were some really nasty things happening in Hong Kong, especially with work, like with workers living in like cages and, and other elements of working conditions being just very terrible in Hong Kong. Most of the protesters are not these, like, really low-class people who live very, very difficult lives every single day. Most of the Hong Kong protesters are, like, middle-class people with some connection to, uh, Western capital that are seeking to have their autonomy from China in the political sense because they don't want to be subject to the interests of the Chinese but rather want to stay subject or associated with the interests of uh, more Western influences, which is, you know, their current state right now. Because obviously, there are many issues that the the population of Hong Kong has, you know, like like the middle class and other people have, because they, they many of them have problems with China. And many of those issues come somewhat from legitimate concerns, but a lot of it is mostly just having the anti-Chinese sentiment because a lot of these people grow up in environments that were originally colonized by the British and the British, by extension, inserted a sort of Hong Kong separatism ideology which did not exist before the colonization happened. Hong Kong ultimately is a part of China. If we're talking about geopolitics, then China should clearly be having control of Hong Kong because of, you know, if China is stronger, then of course China can actually stand up to the Western domination of foreign markets and capital across the world, and then, and then there could be friction, and that friction will ultimately lead to potential for revolutions across the world. And this is, this is part of the reason why many communists support the independence of the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad, not, not necessarily because they support what the government of Assad does, but because there is a multipolar world involved. And that kind of concept of the multipolar world is important for the sake of provoking revolutions in the future. And this is something that I believe Lenin talked about with regards to World War I. Because all the great imperialist powers were fighting, um, it eventually created a common solidarity among the lower class of people who were suffering because of the war. And that led to revolutions happening all over the place after the First World War. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that a, a, a Third World War should happen to create revolution, but having that sort of geopolitical friction will help necessitate the kind of conflict that is necessary which relates to revolution and not fighting between geopolitical entities. That's my initial thoughts. I mean, I can make a whole video about Hong Kong, but if I do, it may or may not be controversial. So, that's what I really have to say with Hong Kong overall. The protests seem to just try to be a reaction against the Chinese eventually taking over the territory, which is China after all. Hong Kong is China. And the protests just seem to be a reaction of that, you know, ongoing process of integrating Hong Kong into China. The West certainly has an interest in keeping China as weak as possible because China is a threat to the geopolitical dominance of the Western countries in the world. So there's that as well. 
Um, regarding the protests, I don't really, I don't really think so much about the protests themselves so much as the greater geopolitical implications of the protests, as I mentioned. So, those are my general thoughts. Vilkart says, question, are nuclear weapons good or bad for maintaining peace and avoiding invasion by foreign powers for a socialist state? Yes. Short answer, yes. Of course there are many anti-nuclear advocates out there, but if you're a small socialist state and you're like in the process of having a revolution, and if you somehow get access to nuclear weapons, then that basically like nullifies most attempts at attack because you can use the nuclear weapons as a deterrent against a larger power, and that's what many countries do, especially the DPRK North Korea. But they're already established, so I'm not sure how it would work in the middle of a revolution with a war communism scenario. I have no idea how that would work. But it would certainly help if they do have nuclear weapons, as it would, you know, be able to effectively make a lot of foreign support back off. Brother number two asks, How many Kulaks have you killed? So because this is a family-friendly channel, the answer, and the real answer, is zero. And thoughts on the theory of permanent revolution. So, with permanent revolution, there's like a meme version that many people subscribe to, which is, you know, Trotsky wanted to uh, conquer all this territory first and then do industrialization. Like, th th that's the general idea and that's, th that's how it is treated as opposed to socialism in one country. But there's actually a lot more to the theory of permanent revolution than what people think. And my thoughts are that people should know more about the actual details, like the real concrete details of the theory of permanent revolution. Um, of course, I still disagree with it, but uh, yeah, people should know more about the theory itself, not, you know, the meme version. Karitonov says, Q&A, will you host games for your subscribers to play, that being on random occasions, uh, Hearts of Iron 4, Worth Under, etc.? Uh, me, personally, no. But if you go to the unofficial Lefty Pole Discord server, which is linked in the video description of this video, then the server does events where you can play games like Hearts of Iron 4, other Paradox games, and I believe War Thunder as well. We, we do have a specialist dedicated to making video game events, and if you want to do that, then, you know, go there and be a part of it. Yosif Stalin says, Thoughts on the new Communist Party of Yugoslavia? I know about these guys, but I don't think that they are extremely significant in the grand scheme of things. I feel like this is just one of many parties that are trying to grasp on to what Yugoslavia had, and unless something really big changes, such as, you know, as I mentioned previously, you know, the uh, incoming global crisis, I don't think the new Communist Party of Yugoslavia will really have much to do in terms of actually changing the former Yugoslav states. Rezok, any opinions on Mexican Zapatism? So, I think the Zapatistas are a very interesting experiment in decentralized uh, a co collective society in a sense. But you know, I don't think that can be replicated on a grand scale and especially not to other places across the world with other material conditions that are very much different. But it is an example that many anarcho-communists anarcho and anarchists and libertarian socialists can follow. However, because my ideology is generally not really dealing with the kind of thing that Zapatism is. Uh, I, you know, I have no real opinion on it besides what I already just said. Brandon Ramirez asks, Favorite smaller known socialists? Um, I would say Paul Cockshot, you know, Michael Roberts, Michael Parenti, and Mark Fisher. Those are some of the authors of the books that I mentioned earlier. Those guys, among others, but that those are like three or four that I have in mind right now. Cigar says, 1. What do you think about Antifa? The European Antifa and American Antifa are very, very different. European Antifa is much more hardcore, I would say, than American Antifa. Both Antifa organizations do a lot in countering rightist protests, and that's something that is respectable, because somebody somewhere should be doing that, doing counter-protests and standing in opposition to far-right extremism, and a place for that is there, and that has my respect. But it's not, like, it's not something that I see becoming a more organized revolutionary movement. I don't think Antifa will be uh, an organized revolutionary movement with particularly defined theory and ideology, at least anytime soon. Wojtek Jelinek says, Opinions on id poll and intersectionality. So, just to answer the question in general, my position is that 
class is the primary thing, and all other issues of society and other identity and things like that, that is subordinated to class. Class is the, the primary thing. And this is not me saying it, this is Karl Marx saying it. I'll, I'll put up like a quotation somewhere here for you to see, but essentially, what many uh, pro id poll and intersectional socialists and anar especially an like anarchists in particular, it's most this is mostly done by anarchists. They have this idea that they can solve the issue of capital and the issue of inequalities and issues relating to identity brought about as a result of capital at the same time. Now, if you read Marx closely, you would see that when resolving these kind these contradictions, Marx said that in the case of socialism. Essentially, when you're doing a socialist revolution, the point of the socialist revolution is to move on from capitalism, right? And as you transition to communism, you then go on to solving the contradictions that were originally occurring in capitalism and as well as some contradictions that may or may not arise in socialism. In the case of socialism, class is the issue that should be the focus of a socialist revolution. And as you transition to communism, other issues such as those relating to identity and id poll and other things, intersectionality, those things should come, those contradictions should be resolved in the movement towards, and the transition towards communism, not in the same process of doing socialist revolution, which should be focusing on altering the base and not affecting so much the superstructure. Remius Studio asks, have any ideological positions changed since your last Q&A video? Was it on a movement, party, country, etc.? Um, because I'm answering this live, essentially, in a pre-recorded video, um, probably yes, I think my mind has changed about certain things, and, um, I'm pretty sure that I would answer questions from my previous Q&A videos differently than I would do right now. Michael Sadovsky says, Do you play War Thunder or any other video games? I play video games, but I don't play War Thunder. And Cub asks, What do you think of the CIA presence in the Hong Kong protests? Now, I certainly think there is a presence there from foreign uh, influences, but I don't think the Hong Kong protests like initially began as a sort of CIA movement. I feel that over time, more and more attention has been put towards the Hong Kong protests by intelligence agencies that are in opposition to China. I feel that's been kind of growing over time, and especially with the recent explosion of anti-Chinese rhetoric on English-speaking websites and forums, I think there is certainly some manipulation happening there to get people manufacturing consent, in the words of Noam Chomsky, against China. And Democratic People's Republic of Denmark asks, opinion on Honecker? Um, obviously I know who Honecker is, but I don't really have a really solid opinion. I mean, he was, you know, leader of East Germany, and East Germany was overall a pretty good uh, socialist state, so I guess opinion is positive, but I don't really have a solid opinion on the man himself. Humza asks, Atheism is a natural and inseparable part of Marxism, says Vladimir Lenin. Do you think religion should be abolished, or do you think freedom of practicing religion should be allowed as long as it does not harm anyone? Um, I'm an atheist myself, um, of course, I think I implied that, but yeah, I, I would say that atheism is a very important part of Marxism and that it should gradually, over time, not forced, but it should be over time with, as you change the base of society, the superstructure will itself then also change. And I think the change of the base with socialism and communism will also change the superstructure in such a way that religion will slowly wither away. I, I, I know that you, Humza, do not think it'll just wither away, but I think with certain policies, there will be a gradual change of belief over time. Because with something as big as the to transition from socialism to communism, we're talking about like, at least a hundred years, at least a hundred years, and a lot of stuff could change in that time, and it's not going to be in a matter of 10 years or 20 years, it's going to be like at least a century in terms of change going on. And as time goes on, I believe that people will gradually just not have an interest in religion anymore. Almighty42 asks, thoughts on Boris Malagursky? So for those of you who don't know, Boris Malagursky is the person who directed the video, or sorry, film, the the weight of chains the weight of chains 2 and the weight of chains 3 as well as other works he's also a key news person for the news outlet sputnik serbia and the weight of chains discusses the ending of yugoslavia 
at the hands of foreign influence, you know, NATO and IMF and all of those things. That's what the first film covers. The second film covers the transition from Yugoslavia after the war to the state that it is more or less today into, you know, a neoliberal sort of set of banana republics. And the third one discusses the actual present day of the Balkans with former Yugoslavia and the future with regards to climate change and the existence of the place as we know it. Chronic Bisexual asks, Do you think left communism is irreconcilable with Marxism-Leninism? As in, could there be unified from between certain left communist ideologies and Marxism-Leninism, similar to the relationship between Luxembourg and the Bolshevik Revolution? So, I can agree that some left communists can work with Marxist-Leninists as, you know, the Italian left comms like Bordiga, as is depicted in Chronic Bisexual's profile picture, was a left communist, but at the same time adopted Leninist principles, some Leninist principles. And in that case, there is a common ground between the Italian left communists and Marxist-Leninists. So that could work. And Death to Imperialism, Freedom to the People asks, what is the biggest problem of today's communism and how outdated do you think communist ML theory is right now? Um, in general, I would say it's somewhat outdated. Not, not very much, but I think that the issue of being outdated is solved very much by the works of people like Paul Cockshot, who are using cybernetics in order to implement a model for a future socialist society with computerized central planning and methods like that. I think the work that people like Paul Cockshot are doing is really keeping the movement modernized as opposed to older theory that is not really up to date for now. And there's also uh, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, which was formulated around 20, 30 years ago. That's, relatively speaking, fairly up to date. And third worldism also exists as well, if you could consider that. Yeah, it, it, it's also an update to, to theory regarding imperialism and things like that. Actually, I answered the second part of that question. As for the first part of the question, I would say the biggest problem of today's communism in terms of the ideology is there seems to be... There seems to not be enough of that modern theory that we need. There is a lot that we can use from the past, but there needs to be a new wave of formulation of theory. Like, not, not, not just Marx and Leninism, Maoism, but much more building on what Cockshot created and synthesizing what Cockshot created with more revolutionary theories and just having more of an update for... Uh, the current postmodern late stage capitalist condition that's a weakness there's not a lot of theoretical or at least not w more mainstream theoretical solutions to the problems that we face right now in terms of the 21st century and upcoming crises and um, ecological issues and things like that as for uh, second question do you see dogmatism and sjwism as problems for the left why and why not how would one deal with them so Dogmatism as in, like, the Hojists, I would say, people like that who are very much, um, um, I don't want to say stuck in the 20th century, but that, that's a little, that's a little derogatory, but I think that's something that fits here. Of course, theory needs to be updated and changed, and oftentimes that updated theory is going to contradict older, um, statements and analyses. And ultimately, if we're talking about the dogmatism that I'm thinking of, it's very much a problem in that refusal to have an update, and people just need to see Marxism and Leninism as a template, not a solidified basis to form all opinions on. Um, I would say that I see Marxism and Leninism as a template to build off of, not so much as the end in terms of theoretical development. As for SJWism, I would say that the kind of people that are SJWs are very much these like American, you know, middle to upper middle class, some are lower class. Um, like university students, some high school students, urban type of people, you know, usually people who haven't had like very difficult lives in terms of economic privilege relative to other parts of the world which are much worse, or even parts of the world that are within places like the United States that are very poor. Like this SJW kind of um, enigma, I would say, emerges particularly from these like more so called liberal areas. And that's something that very much divides the left, as the international proletariat is very much separated from that kind of uh, vision, in the sense that the people who have 
the weapons like the weaponry and technical skills and more advanced hands-on pragmatic ability are those who are genuinely generally more conservative generally um, less open to the kind of behaviors that the so-called SJW crowd um, perpetuate and the sort of elitism that comes from these SJW type of people and their sort of refusal to integrate with those who they disagree with on moral and societal issues is very much something that is an obstacle for a greater unity among people. And three, to what extent are changes that occurred in the 70s, post-Fordism, neoliberalism, post-modernism, important to us, and to what extent are they overlooked in contemporary ML slash communist community? Um... The, yeah, those changes are certainly very, very important. Uh, th uh, third worldism touches on a good amount of them, and the work that Cockshot, Paul Cockshot is doing also touches on some of that in terms of the technological advancements, but there's really a lack. Like, Mark Fisher um, made Capitalist Realism, which is a, certainly a very good book, but there's not really a mass theoretical or at least main kind of mainstream popular movement addressing these developments which have contributed to what many would call globalism in that way. And that is a big hole that needs to be filled in terms of theory and praxis and other matters for um, the left, the far left. The Absurd says, Welcome back, comrade. My question is, how do you feel about the rise of democratic socialism in the USA? So, good question. Well, it's, mo it's mostly social democracy, not democratic socialism. Many people who call themselves democratic socialists are social democrats, so we'll just use social democrats as a term, or at least I will for the purposes of this answering this question. Social democrats. Um, they are... They want to resolve the problems within capitalism using the system of capitalism, and I would say that ultimately more radical measures are needed because if you if you give the pro if you give the proletariat concessions, it's only gonna it only serves to prolong the system in general. If we look historically, the big revolutions of modern history, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, they happened in a state when the people were unfortunately suffering very much because of. Uh, what they were enduring in their life. Like, for Russia, it was World War I. For France, it was the economic downturn and other events that happened around after the support of the American Revolution. And, and these events, like, when people suffer, unfortunately, that's when they become the most class-conscious and determined to do revolution. When it comes to social democracy in the USA, it's not really an end to revolution, but in the long term, it's ultimately going to serve to prolong the system and not do a fundamental change that is needed to get to actual socialism. Kami Pingu asks, What's your opinion on the market socialism and the arguments of Ludwig von Mises? Okay. So, I think market socialism is important for a transitionary period only, in the sense, in a similar NEP style, you could say. I think market socialism is a good, depending on how it is executed, a good template for allowing a less developed country or a country that has a lot of elements of society to, to convert to an actual socialist system, that that can be used as like a method of taking it from a more traditional capitalism or an underdeveloped capitalism to with more and more adjustments and tuning as the productive forces develop, that can be gradually used to transition to a actually socialist system. As for the arguments of Ludwig von Mises, I would say, just for the kind of arguments in general, um, with regards to, like, the inability to plan using central planning, th that kind of general sphere of critique, the thing about that is, Paul Cockshot is solving a lot of that with the implementation of computers. Like Mises, Hayek, you know, these libertarian guys, they, they were not really alive. Well, I mean, they were like they, they were alive like 10, 20 years ago, but it, it wasn't really, you know, as it is now. Like, technology is developing at a very fast pace, and computer technology is basically able to solve most, if not all, of these issues that were brought up by Mises and critiquers of socialism, where you need a lot of bureaucrats and whatnot. A lot of that can just be automated now with computer technology, and it takes the whole question of bureaucrats out the window. A lot of the market economy right now is based on robots and uh, other automated systems to begin with. So it's just a matter of applying the same principles used in current markets to economic planning. And the bog says, are you a spook? No. And that basically marks the end of the Q&A. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I realized while doing this that 
answering more and more questions became like more and more difficult because I had to, you know, think a lot about a various set of subjects in a short amount of time. So in the future, after this one, I might start drafting my answers to the Q&A questions, but at the same time, because of that, I might need to actually write and select questions and curate them, not just answer everything in the future. So just be aware of, instead of just, you know, speaking without anything or any prior formulated ideas regarding the question. So hopefully it wasn't too dry. Um, I'll try and make it better for the future and make it more concise and more enjoyable for the future after this one. So we'll see about that. Thank you all for watching. See you very soon.